how companies define their strategies, how they deal with people not thinking on the longer term, and creating, and I would say, thank God, for, from the new generations coming to the workplace, this strong reaction to uh, deflect and say, that's not for me. Hmm. And, I say, and I say thank God on that, because I believe the new generations are forcing us, all the leaders, to relook at, you know, like the employment deal and, and deal with and say, like, what can we do to retain talent? How to what can we do to increase engagement? Right. How can we do to create a better workplace? That's how I believe our solution comes in and give like a real or a real solution for for uh, leaders to see what the state of their teams are how we soft skills is the main uh, reason like we, we did what we did with with ai uh, and give them like insights of like what's going on the team being remote or not the team being physically present or not right like it doesn't matter but giving real insights of what's going on so they can have open conversation transparent conversations with the team and improve like what that they state are so that's Leadership Story Talks, where we discuss the practices that engage, motivate, develop, retain, and attract people to businesses. We'll give you principles and tools based on real-world stories to leverage listening and storytelling to become a better leader and management professional. Leadership Story Talks is produced by Narrative, a company that focuses on personal storytelling for business. Welcome to Leadership Story Talks. I'm Jerome DeRoy, CEO of Narrative. And I'm Julian Ryan. Hi, Julian. Nice to see you. Um, yeah. So before we move on to introducing our guest, I want to remind our listeners to subscribe to the podcast, leave a review, and check out our YouTube channel where this will also be available. Um, and also the episode's notes and the narrative.com slash podcast where you can find all of our previous episodes. And now I'm going to hand it over to Julianne to introduce our guest today. Well, if you caught me off guard because I was so focused on being excited about our guest today <laughs> and what I wanted to talk about and what we're going to learn today. So today our guest is Cesar Keller. He's an influential leader of the intersection of AI and marketing, specializing in enhancing team performance and leadership development. So he is the founder and CEO of Workplace 21 and Collective Brains. Cesar has pioneered methods that leverage AI to boost organizational growth and team dynamics. He has an extensive background and it includes notable roles as CMO for Nokia um, LATAM and Global Marketing Leadership Team, CEO of HTC America for the same company, and a pivotal marketing position at Microsoft focusing on small business units. Am I getting this correct? Small marketing businesses. That's right. um, he is the author, thank you. He is the author of Non-Human Intelligence, which explores the positive integration of AI in society. His accolades being named top global thought leaders on the future of work and listening of one of the top 100 keynote speakers globally. So I'm going to call, pause and pause my uh, breath for a second and say welcome. We're delighted to have you and I'm going to hand it over to Jerome to take the first question. Great. Thank you so much. And and welcome, Cesar. Really great to have you on the show. Um, so yeah, let's start off with you know a, a very basic question. How did you come to create Workplace 21. Absolutely. So before that, let, let me just say thank you for having me and thank you for your patience to listen to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that nice introduction. Uh, it sounds more than I actually do. <laughs> um, so Workplace 21 is uh, a dear project of mine uh, because there's a purpose connected with, with Workplace 21. And I have spent like 30 years in corporate America and like live different roles and different leadership roles. And I've been in the boardroom and I have done a little bit of everything. And it always called my attention, 
like that leaders uh, not necessarily were recognized by the full skill set that they have, uh, and especially great leaders that knows how to uh, motivate a team, engage a team, and be sure that not only results are delivered, but also how they are delivered are also taken care. So I'm calling caring leaders here. Uh, mm -hmm. Not necessarily those leaders were the most successful ones. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, and sometimes very toxic leaders, very short-sighted were the winners, right? On the power game inside companies and there was who grew more. And I actually put my mind to work and say like, how can we create change for their mm -hmm. reality? Because that's tough, right? Like that's uh, the, the, the power structure, that's the, the, the policies, that's what the boardroom demands from CEOs and how that actually trickles down through HR and policies and whole, for the whole company. That's politics, that's a lot. And to me, uh, we had to find a way to create change from inside companies you know, in a way that is connected to the business and helping leaders not only uh, be seen, but also help leaders to deliver better results through through this tool. So uh, that is that is actually how Workplace was created, like trying to find that solution uh, mm. that will create a wave of change from within the companies. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting hearing you describe, you know, why it was created. And I'm curious, from your vantage point, that that research that you did to to find out where, where you did find out, you know, well, there's a discrepancy between the the quality of these leaders and, you know, essentially what I'm hearing, the better people managers were not necessarily the ones that were getting promoted and moving higher up into the company. And, and even in the worst case scenario, the toxic leaders were the ones who were actually moving up and probably not because of their skills or anything, but more because of power structures and dynamics, right? And so how did you kind of stumble upon this kind of research maybe you didn't stumble upon it maybe it was very intentional but how does one sort of think about that issue in corporations and say that's what i'm going to focus on you know um i'm curious about that how you came to that uh, sort of conclusion of like this is where i can make a difference so the research process is started with my book Mm. The, that you mentioned like uh, on the opening um, where I actually used the book to make like the biggest chunk of my research and on understanding like the trends in the marketplace uh, where we are going what the state of the marketplace is and what are the root causes that are actually creating those trends so the book was to me like the biggest research piece that it took me like a year to, to write the book and help me organize all my thinking. And it's curious that um, when I was doing my, my, my research, there was not great resignation mm. <laughs> and not of those mm. like great new trends that we have seen and we are actually going through. Uh, with so many new names, uh, but actually uh, underneath all that, there's a big dissatisfaction of employees all across the board with the state of the workplace and actually people trying to create change uh, because the situation is not comfortable. So when when I actually analyzed all that and went through like the, the process, and, and given that I have like 30 years and I've seen like companies like in like with different set setups, right? And how actually that transformation came, I could actually find the areas of focus to understand what to do and how to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and one so one of the to me, like the main root causes that help me uh, guide that is the fact that the companies have like open their capitals, right? Like in the last 40 years, uh, so much and brought to the boardroom, like a big uh, 
dictatorship of short-term financials mm. uh, that actually provoke uh, the boardrooms to believe that by hiring the right CEO and fully empower the CEO to deliver short-term results as the main goal and give them like a blank sheet to say you do whatever change you want to do uh, that help to create what we are seeing today with like very short-term view of uh, how companies define their strategies, how they deal with people not thinking on the longer term and creating, and I would say, thank God for <laughs> from the new generations coming to the workplace, this strong reaction to uh, deflect and say, that's not for me. Mm. And, I say, and I say thank God on that because I believe the new generations are forcing us, all the leaders, to relook at, you know, like the employment deal and, and deal with and say like, what can we do to retain talent how to what can we do to increase engagement right how can we do to create a better workplace that's how i believe our solution comes in and give like a real or a real solution for for uh, leaders to see what the state of their teams are how we soft skills is the main uh, reason like we we did what we did with with ai uh, and give them like insights of like what's going on, the team being remote or not, the team being physically present or not, right? Like it doesn't matter, but giving real insights of what's going on. So they can have open convers and transparent conversations with the team and improve like what the, the state are. So that's basically how the research happened and how where we landed. Mm. Thank you. We want to ask, and it's funny when you use the word reaction, that was what something was in my head, because I think in the recent year or and a half after the great resignation and we went back to her, there's been a great reaction, both on the corporate side, as well as the human side with more downsizing and restructuring for assorted reasons. So I think you're you're talking about this as a pivotal time. I do want to be selfish and ask you to clarify something because we mentioned two different companies. So one of the things, and I've met you before through Collective Brains, is maybe just give the listeners an overview of how that's shown up in those two organizations, because you have been taking a holistic view of the mm. workplace and what a uh, problem as well as solution. So if you can indulge us for a second, and then we'll pivot back to the land of AI. Absolutely. And cut me short if I start prolonging this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the solution to actually help uh, team leaders and teams to actually uh, be in a better state or, or create a better support for, for those leaders to show their impact on the organization uh, came first on Workplace 21 through a product called Viki. Uh, mm -hmm. And Vicky is a virtual coach uh, that is not only a bot, right? There's many bots out there, like people are creating bots now, like with GPT, like <laughs> a bucket of bots that you can that you can hire. But uh, Vicky is not a bot. Vicky is actually a virtual coach. And, and the reason uh, Vicky is a virtual coach is that we have a whole human model on how to measure and show in a in a very simple dashboard the state of soft skills for any team. So when I say soft skills, I'm talking about in our model what we call ACE uh, with four main uh, KPIs. So we are talking about ACE stands for uh, adaptability, communication, collaboration, and engagement. So we measure those four for all team members and for the, the whole team uh, as an average. And for leaders, we offer two other KPIs, one that is very dear and important, that is trust. Uh, you can imagine uh, how difficult it is to measure trust. <laughs> so that, that comes the years of research behind, uh, where we show the ability of a, of a leader create a trust environment where like 
that people can thrive, right? And take risks, show like all that. And the second is the management practices. So like in a more practical way, are they being like fair, are they being effective, like you know, how they are managing their teams. So mm -hmm. with those six KPIs, uh, plus like there's a few things that we add there, like uh, that is very important for the model. We create a balance scorecard of team performance based on soft skills. Uh, one question that I got always is to say, why soft skills? And like the, the reason is very simple. If you read the more than 200 different methodologies for team performance out there on behavioral sciences, uh, they all come to the same point to say like for a team to perform better, uh, they need to have better soft skills. Hard skills is easy to get, it's easy to hire, it's bring someone you train someone to get a hard skill. Soft skills are so hard, right? Like to develop and to train. And, and once teams start improving on soft skills, um, their relationship improve. And you know that when people start relating to each other in a good way, you can unleash higher performance. So that's the idea. We provide the dashboard and a virtual coach that is continuously coaching people and asking them to actually think about it, reflect on this, or make this exercise. And as people start actually getting aware of the state of their soft skills and start working on that, the team start progressing towards a better relationship. And then uh, with better relationship performances start growing. Then as we are doing that, and uh, as Vicky works, we unveil many different skills and, and other learning needs that like every team member needs to go through that sometimes Vicky itself recommends like a book or a training or something. Uh, but also we thought that we need to find a way to provide a, an effective and easy way for people to develop those skills to get those learnings. And that's where Collective Brains was born, the second mm -hmm. company. Uh, because we said, like, how do we actually get a mechanism to help like people and companies to fill those gaps in a very effective way, in a very short way? And, and we found on executive mentoring the right element to do that, because today there's no limit to who you can talk to and like, like through like, you know, any of, of those virtual calls, uh, 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 tools that we have today. Mm -hmm. So basically we jump on creating first, uh, an amazing network of today. We have 120 executive mentors, uh, to engage with people on whatever need they have, right? Like, and. The whole idea is to be able to provide to like all people that comes through someone that have had experience on exactly the area that they are, right? So if, if it doesn't matter, it's a profession industry, we go through like to find someone that have been there and done that. So they can share the right experiences. They can guide you through the learning. And most of all, uh, help you not only learn, but to actually apply that learn on the job you are doing. So that's the, the main idea of collective brains. Mm. And, and of course, as we started, uh, we learned that like we need to develop new products based on executive mentoring to supply all the needs that companies had. So for example, uh, we created the very first executive uh, mentoring certification course and other courses that, that comes like as solutions to that to help mentors to be effective mentors. Uh, because we learned that companies are not offering any training or any development for, for their internal mentoring programs. And, and other products that if you guys want to, like we can talk about it, but that, that was the whole idea on how Collective Brains was born. So Workplace 21, we have a virtual coach that delivers like, all the what technology can provide to give a whole map and a whole development map for a company. And then only specific needs to go deeper to actually mentor or coach someone or a team that needs higher performance in short 
period of time or to have like a longer career development or something that requires human coaching and mentoring. You have collective brains. Then those, those two connect. That's the idea. Okay. I wanted to go back to the six KPIs you mentioned because there was mm -hmm. one in particular that's come back a lot on this podcast, uh, which is trust. And, and trust is something that we also, you know, work with a lot of our clients with in terms of, you know, uh, storytelling training programs where, you know, we have a number of exercises where when people start to share, to share personal stories about their lives, their careers, et cetera, there's, uh, and especially when executives are in the room as well, it creates a bond, a connection b between people where people come out of that and say, well, now I, I really do trust my boss to actually follow through with their with what they said they would do, right? And so, but I'm curious in terms of your process of measuring trust, what have you seen has that that's effectively created more trust in the in the workplace? The 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 main word to me that is connected with creating a trust environment is caring. Mm -hmm. Caring leaders, right? Like, uh, I love a, a saying uh, that is, um, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Mm. And, and that for teams is like directly applicable, right? Like, it doesn't matter how wise and knowledgeable your boss is <laughs> if they don't show like how they care about you. And and, and and caring is the main condition to create trust, right? Like when you know that someone cares about you, what you're going through, like what the situation is, uh, trust is naturally built, right? Uh, for different, for many reasons. Like one is just the comfort to know that like you are working with someone who cares, uh, but also because leaders who cares also show vulnerability. And that is a very key word, right? Like on creating trust to say like, I'm not perfect. I make my mistakes too, mm. right? I'm not a superhero. Uh, and as and as I show as a leader vulnerability, the team also knows that they can show theirs. And as the whole group starts sharing those vulnerabilities, people now feel comfortable to share ideas, to risk an opinion, right, in a meeting, uh, even if it is um, silly, right, like to say, like, when you feel comfortable to say, hey, guys, I don't know what I'm actually, if this is a good idea or not, but mm. here's, here's something that popped on my mind when we were discussing this. And if people feel comfortable to do that, uh, that means that that team has actually reached a level of trust. So in terms of measuring that, there's many signals that we can collect from people's behaviors and from people conversations and all that, that give us a good measure if the team has or not trust and how much they have mm -hmm. and, and what the, the path there. Did, did I answer your question, Jerome? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, definitely. And I want to hop on that one because it's very good with trust. You said you did a lot of research. In that research, are you providing your potential corporate or current corporate clients what, what it means to break trust? Now, we've just done a lot of restructuring. And the statistics even years ago said once you did a restructuring, even if you're not impacted, it changes trust factor in an organization between five and 10 years before they start to coagulate and that might be an absurd number in our current workplace but i'm interested in knowing too about that factor but also another bit i really when i reached out to you and i was researching a, a speech you told me you had this amazing pro product and you said you you curated the vicky person for coaching for voice and tone and level and situation and language so are you training this entity to be culturally different? Like I kept thinking, is there a New York version? But <laughs> <laughs> say, hey, look at me, look up, <laughs> pay attention. I told you this already. Like, are, how are you figuring out? Because there's so many variables in that to 
gaining trust is also that person gets me and understands and listen um, to what I'm doing. So I'm just curious the science because this, the the um, soft scale measurement gets people to look up. Whenever I've told somebody about your your product. That has been the the missing factor in everything. So there's a lot of people besides me going, show me, how's that done? How do you measure it? So tell us so, more. <laughs> so basically, so that, it's a summation. That's, that's a very interesting question. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the AI tool behind, right? The model that, mm -hmm. that you use, it is a reactive model from that sense. So yes, because like you drive the tone of the conversation primarily, right? And you're going to get a reaction that is aligned with how and what you are proposing to talk if you, uh, but also you can ask Vicky to say, hey, based on your experience, what should we discuss next? Or how do you think you can help me next? And, and, and that is where, of course, more than culture, the human model and the dashboard actually guides Vicky to say, let me give you like a very common example. A lot of people have great intentions, but stum stumble on communication, right? Mm -hmm. And and communication is like usually the villain behind like especially written communication. I right? like to say it's the villain uh, when people misunderstand or misinterpret like what what the other person is trying trying to say reacts and it takes an entire day to clean this late to say no that's not what I meant I actually mm -hmm. so and then oh, yeah. you find out. You, you you know you you know what I'm talking about here right so uh, so. If Vicky looks at in communication, for example, is a soft skill that has not been like the driver of better performance, most likely Vicky will focus on communication first. Just say like, let me help you with that, uh, because that will unleash like uh, many other soft skills. I have something very cool to say on that model if you guys want me to share about that about soft skills but communication is on the route for every single uh, like <laughs> soft mm. skill right uh so if you communicate better you probably have a better collaboration if you communicate well you probably have a better engagement right and and, mm. and everything comes 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 in place so 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 that conversation to me it's very human basic right like re regardless of the culture regardless of like how you communicate it they need to develop those skills are very again a very basic for human needs right like to actually do it so the way vic is going to talk to you it's 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 not culturally adapted but at the same time i'm not seeing the need to be uh mm -hmm. because, <laughs> because you know, like the way you provide guidance is in a direct way, right? Like there's, uh, there's no softing out, like to say, hey, here's like what you should do, how we focus. And, mm -hmm. and once the conversation goes and the way you reply to like the first prompt or the second prompt is going to guide what the answer is going to be. So to me, it's naturally adaptable in that sense. Mm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Very yeah. interesting. But yeah, and you know, it makes sense to me that the the way you're approaching AI and the entire kind of measurement of soft skills and and solving for those gaps, essentially, um, it, it's really a combination. I mean, you're you're kind of using AI in this sort of virtual coach that's named Vicky, you know, and, and then wherever that limit is, when someone needs the guidance of of a human being for something more specific, where you know AI is limited, so still, even though there's been a lot of progress, it makes sense to me that then you would, uh, you know, you would you would kind of pair people up with the right person um, to to solve that, to to fill that gap, um, because I think what we've seen, we've been talking about AI as well on this trust, and that was the other question I had on my mind too, and I'm glad you covered it, um, but that's kind of where we've seen things fall is that you know, we're, 
doubling down on AI and that's all it's going to be. It's all going to be virtual or no, actually that's really dangerous. We don't want to have anything to do with AI, but then clearly there is sort of a middle road that's appearing as well. And it sounds to me like you're, you're part of that, of that movement of, of people who are trusting that we can do good things with AI. And if it's, it's got the safeguards and, you know, and, and if those gaps are filled by real human beings. Very interesting questions, Jerome. And I'm a technologist, right? Like I'm an engineer, electronic engineer. It's like my 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 grad and my career, my life took like a fork way, like more on the human side, right? How mm. to understand behaviors, like in on marketing, and then finally on HR. So I, my my life took this fork. What I keep being a technologist, and I understand technology, work for technology companies, and I also understand well like the how humans behave and like what behavioral science is behind that actually drive like what we need so so it's interesting to think on the role of ai uh moving forward that's a little bit but more than a little bit this is something that i cover on my book as well i like to say mm -hmm. uh to me the role of ai on that like how humans uh work with ai or if AI replace human work, like at a certain point, to me, it depends only on how far you look, right? Like mm -hmm. in terms like of time. Uh, when I wrote my book, that was seven years ago, uh, people were reading my book and say, are you crazy? What are you talking about? And, and now like everyone like says like, oh yeah, you said that seven <laughs> years ago. Uh, <laughs> so, so if you look at what is going to be 10 years from now, it's different from what's going to be 20 years from now. Of course, very different from what's going to be 30 years from now. And then it goes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because AI, it's a self-learning uh, technology. And that discussion, if you're creating a new species, it's real to me. Uh, and it's going to keep progressing that discussion until we will have to find gaps between like what we believe uh, in terms of faith versus like, like, are we gods? Are we not? Can we create a new species that's going to be a like a totally independent like species or not? And then he goes, I think we're going to get to that level. It is just a matter of time. It's mm -hmm. technology. Technology grows like super fast. And the only parallel that I can give, like everyone to understand what I'm saying is if you go back 15 years ago, it's actually a little bit over that now, but 15 years ago, there was no iPhone, there was no apps, right? And if you're going to leave home, you need to study your map, right? How are you going to drive through and what, right? So, and then it goes, now you have like GPS, they give you like alternative routes immediately, right? I don't know you guys, but I cannot leave my home without my pocket device anymore because like I don't know where to go what to do when come back like I don't I'm fully dependent and that was only 15 years right like our life uh, was fully dependent and there was a new component called application there's an app mm. that now there's an app for everything that we are fully depend on that so we order our Starbucks on the way we just go there and pick the Starbucks app, right? Like, so it's mm -hmm. all dependent on, on those apps. If we look at 15 years ahead, uh, to me, we are going to be fully dependent on virtual assistants, right? That's what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, on, even on our ability to plan uh, or to get full debriefs of where we should be, what we should do, like we are going to think differently 15 years from now because assistants are going to be so powerful that we don't need to do that part of any of the, of the daily routine anymore. Uh, and if you keep going and say there will be new technologies crossing the path with AI that are, in terms of hardware that is going to impact tremendously the ability for like those virtual assistants become like almost real people, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. <laughs> let's say this way uh, on the way they act and behave and, 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 and do the jobs that we do. Mm -hmm. So 
the way AI is going to replace the humans at work, it depends on how far we look ahead. What I believe, the part that is going to be, um, that will be a lot of demand for humans to keep investing on and delivering like their jobs or like their work or their contribution is what I'm what I, I call like caring jobs where humans take care of other humans. Hmm. When we think about like white collar jobs, blue collar jobs, like over time, it doesn't matter if it's 15, 30, 50, that will be a replacement at a certain point. Hmm. I don't think on the next 15 years, that will be a full replacement. That's not what I'm saying. And there will be new jobs. Yes, there will be new jobs, of course. That are going to demand a lot of more skills, a lot of more studies, studying, the, you know, like crossing fields. There will be like a huge demand for like uh, high educated jobs every time more. No doubt. Less jobs, probably. Uh, there will be a full replacement for jobs where we take care of each other. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Right. So if there's, there's a small sign now going on, on hospitals and hospitals is like a great example of how we're going to looking at that future. Uh, for example, if you look at what's going on on the payroll of hospitals, the number of doctors are going down and they are now foreseeing that it's going to keep going down. We're going to need less and less doctors because they are way more efficient, like, and there's more uh, robots in the, on the surgery room, right? And there'll be more and more and more procedures that you don't need so many doctors to actually do what, what you do. Uh, diagnosis is faster. So also they can see more people in an hour. So mm -hmm. there's all this, mm -hmm. this development going on. On the other hand, the number of nurses keep increasing. Mm -hmm. There's way more nurses than before. It's going to actually, it, 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 there's a huge need that's not actually being fulfilled today of more nurses in hospitals because that's no enough labor to actually do the job. And that's what I'm saying. Like nurses are the ones who really take care of the patients, right? On the, yeah. on like on recovery, uh, being there, and so that one's talking about like caring jobs, jobs where people take care of other human beings. That's where I, the the demand is gonna explode, mm -hmm. and 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 that's gonna be a big push, on my view, for us just to be better humans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. It's full circle with what it's you were circle. talking about very early on in describing the KPIs and that the most important thing is caring, actually, which are those leaders that care and how do we measure that? Yeah, really interesting. Jules, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, caring also means contracting and what caring is in an organization to build trust because every organization has its own value system about what the behaviors need to be and what their environment is. So it's very interesting. Now, I laugh when you talked about your GPS system because I have a challenged relationship with mine. I've nicknamed her Cyborgia many years ago because we argue. Um, I have an excellent sense of direction because I had to growing up to where I was. And I still read the app i use the app now more than the paper map but i always have to study because i have low trust with my car <laughs> and i'm usually right when that happens so i'm looking at change and opportunity so there's challenge and opportunity the caring part i hear what you're saying because when i did a lot of research recently about ai um I talked to mental health professionals and doctors and they said, you know, it's more important now to have curiosity and um, intuition and criti critical thinking skills, but you have to practice those. You can't just come out of nowhere. And, mm -hmm. and I keep wondering, there's no question. It's just more of a comment here. Like I, when I go to the supermarket, totally different field, there's a robot following me around and, um, and it, couldn't that also be the case in hospitals now, that instead of a nice aid that gives a cheery high, that we're going to get robots greeting us and doing 90, you know, maybe 50% of what was normally a, uh, 
an orderly or somebody like feet on the ground, literally two feet on the ground person. So I'm just kind of mulling a little bit um, about where the positives and challenges when people are looking at how they use this for their organizations. Oh, less with me a little bit, uh, <laughs> Julian. Mm -hmm. The other thing, I, I live in Bellevue, Washington here, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of tech companies all like, mm -hmm. usually they apply first hand technology here and all that. But the other day I mm -hmm. had like a very futuristic uh, reality in my normal day. I went to the supermarket because I need to do a new, a copy of a kit, right? Like, so, so, okay. And I researched and I learned that like I could do it at the supermarket. So mm -hmm. I, I got my car and from the moment that I got into the parking lot, there was absolutely no one. It was mid afternoon. There's like people were working. I was in the supermarket, um, but I actually parked my car. There was no one. I climbed the stairs. I, I got into the supermarket and I crossed no one. And I drove to a machine that actually create four copies of my key uh, and build me right Touchless, of course, like, and send me the receipt through email. I got my keys. I got back into the car. I crossed one supermarket employee. I got back mm -hmm. to my car, drove back home. And, and it, it struck me. It did mm -hmm. struck me. Mm -hmm. I got back home and I sat down and I said, wow, like, that's happening. I crossed one employee of an entire huge store of a supermarket mm -hmm. in my trip in and out, right? The entire thing. I did everything that I needed and I didn't talk to a single person and all that. So mm -hmm. that is reality. This is kicking in, right? Uh, I don't think that we are going to, and we need to, or we or we are going to replace like people in very important jobs at this, at this moment, right? Like that would be more cooperation between AI, but AI is learning. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're still going to see our psychoanalyst. We're still going to go to the doctor. We're still going to have our mentoring, right? And our coaching. And by the way, one comment for your audience here that I forgot to mention Julian is one amazing mentor at Collective Brains. Let me just, <laughs> <laughs> just if you're going to talk Thank to you. Julian, Thank you can look for Collective Brains. Okay. So, um, so that will be a lot of collaboration, but how much they're going to learn and how how yeah. how much those jobs are going to be replaced to me is just a matter of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like the first tier, uh -huh. you know, caring humans are, are needed and then eventually AI is going to learn that too, right? So yeah. So, yeah, well, this is really... Fantastic. I wish we could, maybe we'll have a part two because there's just so much we can, we can discuss here and, and um, even debate about actually. Uh, but one question I want to get to, which is the one that we ask of all of our guests. Um, and that is, w could you tell us about an experience that has shaped who you are mm -hmm. today, still influences you, informs your work? I uh... care. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> And that's one that really define, defines who I am today as a professional, right? And, and even as a human being. So I started my career in consulting, strategic consulting, and my view of the world was all like corporate politics and power influence and how to actually, right, like help to fold the company this way or that way. Mm. And then it goes, okay. And I moved to like, more regular jobs like on industries companies and all that and i start working with this leader and I, of course i'm going to actually surprise here names of in brands <laughs> <laughs> but i start working with this leader and this and and this leader actually was invited to work on a very traditional old style like food company and to actually, he was the, the CCO, the chief commercial officer. So he brought his entire team and he so glad he invited me to be the head of marketing for this company. And there was new heads for sales, like for every other function on this commercial side. So you can imagine that in no time, there was a potential clash 
between new style, new folks coming to the company and the legacy, like old leaders, 30 years mm -hmm. in the company, right? Old thinking and all that. So I would say like in most cases, that would be a clash. That would be a horrible culture, like redefinition of the company and repacking. Like that, that would probably be a very traumatic experience for everyone. Mm. But this leader, that is still my model today, was huh. so good on on caring and on soft skills, on everything that comes along on the human side. Like that, the way he model his behavior on actually getting into so graciously into this organization and respecting like the history, respecting the thinking, respecting like, like every single person in the company that when our team, right? Like on, on the making there would bring like a discussion on a conversation about, I don't know, oh, they are saying this or they are saying that and like, you know, like seeing intrigue or seeing like mm -hmm. politics, uh, he would be the one modeling the conversation to say, no, I don't think so. Have you asked this person about it? Have you actually talked and, you know, like try to clarify what you think, what they think? And he modeled that over and over and over again to a point where when results will start actually coming and they were super fast to come, uh, he had like the pact from not only from us, the new organization to work with him, but like from the entire organization because mm -hmm. everyone saw the value, right? Like of, and then trust, and then like everything started actually falling in place. So in less than a year, we were a high performing team. And that was the only one high performing team, truly high performing team that I have worked to. We mm -hmm. practically triple the size of the company in two years. It was like, wow. it's just amazing. Just amazing, the power of that. That experience to me, Jerome, was life transforming. And I learned the power of actually being a great leader, a great person behind and modeling the, that behavior as a, as a force, as a forcing function to actually create change in the right way inside companies. Mm. Wow. Fantastic. Wow. Thanks for thanks for sharing that. And and yeah, again, it's it's interesting how we can make the connection from what you were talking about earlier with the six KPIs and how you how you think about soft skills um to this story, which yeah, I can make a direct line, right? So so that's fantastic. Thank you so much. I I uh, I really appreciate your um openness to talk about it, all of this and and uh you know also sharing that story with us because it does show us, I mean. This entire episode has been about the tension between, you know, technology and humans, essentially, and and how you're embracing that in your in your line of work. And and I feel like this story gives us such a, a reason to believe uh -huh. in that. Right? It's like these there are these humans that have these special abilities that can be replicated because they inspire others, like you were inspired, and you know now you're doing something to to help humans nurture those kinds of skills and and build on them yeah and Ooh, how hopefully. Cesar presents here is how he's presented to me in every other conversation I've had with him and I've had the pleasure of speaking with you and right. the values come through and the purpose because when I did meet you I grilled you six ways <laughs> sometimes what is this thing what are you doing why but you it really comes through and that is a point and what if we all in our organization could figure out ways to do a little bit about more what your your former boss did how much could we get done and how effective would it be it would be a, a real pleasure mm. so thank you yeah thanks for listening and letting me toss questions at you in this matter so thank you and it's a great uh great question to reflect on for our audience right uh based on this what are you what are you getting out of this what how, do, how are you thinking about that consistency of playing out your values and um, you know, that, that care for others. So wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Cesar. I, I know that there are uh, many ways that people can reach you um, between the two companies you mentioned. Uh, you also mentioned to us before the show, your blog. Um, and uh, is there anything else that you would like to leave with our audience before, before we say goodbye? <laughs> 
so first and foremost, thank you for the opportunity to speak and the patience to listen to me again. Uh, and if you like the idea of Vicky, uh, you that are listening to this and you'd like to test that technology in July, we will be looking for better customers again. We are coming mm -hmm. back to market in July. So open, like if you, if you want to try, uh, it, it, it might be one person, it might be a team, like, but uh, glad to actually have you as, as a better customer. Mm, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. That's a, that's a great offering. Um, and yes, I, I encourage all of our listeners to go and check out uh, those websites. Everything will be in the episode notes uh, and be on the lookout in July for that wonderful opportunity. Um, and also I want to remind people that if you've been inspired by this session, we've heard some great stories here. This is something that you can consider enrolling yourself um, and or your team in our group and one-on-one -on -one training programs that focus exactly on storytelling and listening as well, where you can find, craft, and tell stories for leadership development, sales, team building, employee engagement, and many other applications. So if you're interested in that, you can go to narrative.com, N-A-R-A-T-I-V.com to enroll. We're always happy to listen to you. And as always, thanks for thanks for listening to this episode. And don't forget to subscribe, leave a review on your favorite pod podcast platform. And remember that we're also on YouTube if you want to see us on video. All of this drives word of mouth. And we want as many people to benefit from these kinds, this kind of wisdom that Cesar just shared with us today. So again, thank you. Thank you, Jules, for being my yeah. wonderful co-host. Always learning, always listening, and I'm more more's around the corner. So it's fascinating. So these are gifts. So thank you very, very much, Cesar. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much, Cesar. Really appreciate it. All right, everyone. We'll see you next time. For more information on the narrative listening and storytelling method and how it can help your business, go to narrative.com. <laughs>